Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Cassandra Feeney. I am the president of the Women's Bar Association. This is a, a CLE we're doing together with the Roger Williams School of Law, and we are so excited to be doing that. It's our last CLE of the year. Um, what I'm going to do is, is introduce to you Nicole Jislewski, who is the Director of Special Programs um, and Academic Affairs. Um, she is also this year's Ada Sawyer recipient from the Rhode Island Women's Bar Association. She will receive the award at our annual dinner, which is uh, June 15th at 6 p.m. at the Providence Marriott. So please mark your calendar, go to our website, riwba.com to register. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time because we have such a great CLE today, but Nicole, she was instrumental in identifying the first women attorneys in Rhode Island. She put all of that work into two law review articles that were published. Um, she is teaching diversity in the law school, and she's also published a book, Integrating Doctrine and Diversity, Inclusion and Equity in the Law School Classroom. So I will turn it over to Nicole. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cassie. That was like the warmest welcome ever. Um, I am going to start um, by reading uh, a land and labor acknowledgement. Um, before we begin, I want to take a moment to reflect on the lands on which we reside. We are coming from many places, physically and remotely, and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located in Bristol, Rhode Island. And so I want to acknowledge and honor the Narragansett and Poconoke people and Soams, the original name of the land upon which our campus resides. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if it wasn't for the free enslaved labor of black people. And we recognize that the town of Bristol and the very land our campus resides have benefited significantly from the trade of enslaved people from Africa. The economy of New England, Rhode Island, and more specifically, the town of Bristol was built from wealth generated through the triangle trade of human lives. During this time of national reckoning with our history of slavery and the disparate treatment of black people, we honor the legacy of the African diaspora and the black lives, knowledge, and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. While the movement for justice and liberation is ever building and we're witnessing the power of the people, many are still being met with violence and even being killed. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who have been met with violence, physical, mental, and emotional violence through our privilege. And as upholders of justice, we believe that our students who will soon be practitioners of law can be and already are agents of change as well. And for those who are not familiar with this practice, why do we do land and labor acknowledgements? I wanna share with you a statement from Northwestern University's Native American Indigenous Initiatives. Quote, it is important to understand the longstanding history that has brought you to reside on the land and to seek to understand your place within that history. Land and labor acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Um, I want to introduce our moderator for today, Professor Monica Sarah D'Souza. Monica, take it away. Well, hello everyone. It's wonderful to be here with all of you today. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about um, how we're going to start this conversation. Uh, my role is as moderator, and I really want to introduce you to a number of people here at Roger Williams uh, University Law School who have put together this course on uh, race and the American foundations of the law. And I want to tell you just a little bit about um, how each of them participated in shaping this course. And also we wanna to convey to you how this uh, really was, what the origin story is of this uh, course at our law school. So my role, uh, not only as moderator today, but also to tell you a little bit about what I do as it relates to this class. I'm one of the teachers, one of the instructors in the course. Um, typically I teach property law, I teach family education law, 
but I'm also teaching in this Race and the Foundations of the American Law course. So uh, with that, I want to tell you a little bit about what happened at the law school um, in the summer of 2020. And so as many of you who are here today know, this, of course, was the summer where uh, Americans uh, all across the country saw the murder of uh, George Floyd. And in what has somewhat become cliched, uh, this really did ignite um, a historic series of protests and law schools were not immune to those protests. And one of the consequences at Roger Williams was that students um, began to discuss these issues much more openly, not only with one another, but also with faculty, with also with administration. And in particular, our Black Law Students Association um, brought their concerns uh, to the faculty and to the administration. Now, at RWU Law, we have a mission as a law school, and our mission is to provide an excellent legal education that is focused on the development of students' analytical, ethical, and other practice skills through the exploration of legal doctrine, policy, history, and theory including the relationship between law and social inequality. And so in response and in order to address this mission and the requests of our students, RWU Law faculty approved a class titled Race and the Foundations of Law. And so as we discuss the class, we'll learn from our panelists how the class relates to the work that we do as lawyers and that we are training our students to do as attorneys, and also how we envision uh, this class as potentially, hopefully, having an impact on the practice of law in Rhode Island. So with that, I want to ask all our panelists to turn on uh, their video so that we can all see each other. And I'm going to turn to our first speaker for today, who is Dean uh, Lorraine Lally. And uh, Dean Lally, what I'd like to ask you to do first is tell us a little bit about your role at the law school, particularly your role in this summer of 2020, and tell us a little bit about this history that I briefly mentioned here at the law school. In other words, what was the impetus, what was the drive for creating this class um, at the law school? And you know, acknowledging that this was a largely a student-driven effort, and why is that fact important for us to keep in mind? Great, thank you, Monica. Um, I think it's first important to acknowledge that this was because of student advocacy um, in June 2020, and the advocacy um, had started earlier in the year. Um, I'm Dean of Students at the Law School, and so I work directly to support students in the professional and career goals. And part of what I do is listen to the students and make sure that the community that we're building here is responsive to the students' needs and supports their um, full development as future lawyers. Um, and that academic year, so I'll say 19, um, sorry, um, 2019 to 2020, we were already going through a racial reckoning within the school building. So we had had a couple of town halls, and this is the opportunity for students to address members of the faculty and members of the administration. And they were sharing stories, not just about what was happening in the classroom, but what their overall experience was um, in Bristol and in Rhode Island. Um, it's very important that this was student led and that we give um, that we acknowledge the work that the students did because they were speaking about their primary experiences. And it was the first time that it wasn't just about what was happening in the building, but also even broader about what was happen happening in the community. And the murder of George Floyd really enabled students to speak loudly and speak, speak collectively that the status quo was no longer okay. Um, and so they issued a series of demands in, July, in June 2020, and the demands was a call to action that their presence within the legal academy was not sufficient, um, that what they were asking us for was a deeper analysis of what was required by the legal community. So that was both the administration as well as the faculty. And in June 2020, they issued a 
um, series of demands. And so the initial demands had 17 demands and I categorized them in four categories. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge what exactly they were asking for. So first they were asking for a series of changes regarding the curriculum. Second, they were asking for academic support and the tools that they needed to succeed. Third, they were specifically asking the law school to use its power and influence within the state of Rhode Island and within the town of Bristol to address housing and police discrimination that they were experiencing on a regular basis. And fourth, they wanted accountability within our environment. So they wanted a system specifically to address harms and biases within the School of Law community. Um, today, we're focusing primarily on the course, or what they wanted curricularly. And there they had a series of demands. First, they wanted critical race theory to be a universal course and required for all students. But they also wanted all classes within the School of Law to be taught with a racial lens. Um, they were very dissatisfied with coming to class, but still listening to lectures that might have been prepared before, you know, before the law school um, had more racial diversity. They wanted to be present in the curriculum and acknowledged um, and, and for the, the instruction to acknowledge their place in history. They wanted discussions of intersectionality and race and law. And they also wanted a classroom climate where teachers um, and their fellow students were better equipped to handle comments relating to, um, that created harm, that related to um, diversity and bias. In other words, they wanted specific instruction so that if someone said something that wasn't well-informed or wasn't, it wasn't about political um, correctness, but was insensitive or uninformed or not grounded in the law. They wanted a mechanism to address that, and they wanted faculty that were, were comfortable addressing that. So it's critical that this came from BALSA, um, because we've been working on diversity. I see Siobhan stevens Catalo, one of the instructors in the course, is on the call, and she started working on diversity at the law school as an employee 20 years ago, um, just about 20 years ago. And so it's work that we've been continuing to do, um, but the students' voices are what enabled us to really implement changes. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Lally. That was incredibly helpful and useful so we can understand exactly how this was uh, uh, organized and how it was put together. And one of the interesting things that you talked about in terms of how the students were feeling about their classroom experience really leads us to our next panelist, who is Professor Diana Hassel, um, because really looking at how some of this information and some of their concerns could then be brought to the forefront in the classroom experience is incredibly important. So Professor Hassel, if you would tell us first just a little bit about your uh, history here at the school, how long you've been here, what courses you teach, um, and then how you were responsive in being able to uh, integrate these requests into your class. And so specifically then leading from that to some of the themes of this new class, that you were integral in creating. And um, also, if you could, just talking a little bit about the pedagogical approach that you took um, in putting forth this material to the students. Thank you, Monica. And I'm very excited to have this opportunity to share what we've been doing uh, with the larger community. So thank you all for attending. Um, so I've been teaching at Roger Williams for a very long time, about 25 years and teaching in the areas of constitutional law and civil rights. And uh, more recently in the past several years, race and the law and critical race theory. So when the opportunity arose to create this course in response to um, student requests and, and also in response to faculty uh, interest and requests also, I was part of the team that helped uh, put together the, the, the essential structure of the class. And, what we wanted to do is uh, both give our students um, an insight or some information about how racial hierarchy is incredibly embedded in American law and uh, uh, starting with the first arrival of Europeans to North America. So we start with a sort of a history of colonialism, uh, uh, enslavement as it was practiced here in North America, uh, the reconstruction era, the Jim Crow era, looking at the rate at the legal framework 
that um, created these systems and, and upheld them. But along the way of looking how race became such a factor in the creation of law, we also look at the historic opportunities for rebellion and resistance and transformation. As they has also happened throughout our history, what has been the response, what has been the pushback, what has been the response of the community who is being oppressed, how have those things also um, determined the, the, the structure of our law? Then we move on to the middle section of the course where we look at how some of these historic um, uh, historic events have still echoes in our current legal system. So looking at things like mass incarceration and housing discrimination and voter suppression and seeing the echoes of the earlier, more explicitly race-based law, how that is still with us in various forms. Um, and again, looking at what the law has accomplished, what it hasn't, where the limits have been. Throughout this whole project, we're trying to help the students have a sense of what is the particular responsibility of lawyers in this system, in this legal system that um, supports and upholds racial injustice, what as being part of that system, what is our role? And then the last third of the class is about repair, reparations, going forward, what are some of the ideas people have to transform the system? Again, what's the particular role of the lawyers? What's effective? What's not effective? Uh, what kind of ideas might be helpful in trying to uh, undo some of the damage that has been done uh, through this, this kind of um, this system of law that we have? So we do an arc of where we came from, where we are, where can we go? Uh, and I, I guess I wanna say something a little bit about, we ask the students to participate in several different ways. There's, they have to, there's discussion in class in large groups and small groups, there's written assignments, there's reflections on their work. So we're asking the students to do some things that are a little untraditional in the, in the law school setting to have various ways for them to um, absorb and integrate this information. So I think that's the basic structure. And as we go forward, we've taught it one year now as a required course. And as we go forward, we refine it, we you know uh, make some changes, but I think that basic structure of how we got here, where we are, where we're going, and what do we, what is our role, what is our responsibilities as, as members of the legal community is one that we will uh, keep. Thank you so much, Professor Hassel. And I, I really love the point that you made about how we as law professors, lawyers, law students, we are uniquely situated, not only to examine these issues, but to hopefully prevent further iterations of some of these same problems from taking place again in the future. And so as we think about the work that you have done, other of your colleagues have done in putting this class together, I want to turn the discu discussion over to our next panelist, who is Professor uh, Bernard Freeman. And uh, Professor Freeman, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about uh, your role as well here at the law school, but also following up on what Professor Hassel was mentioning in terms of, again, how law schools are uniquely situated to help students understand these issues. Um, what are you seeing in legal education uh, across the country in terms of uh, whether or not our class here at Roger Williams is unique? Is it part of a trend that other schools um, are also uh, engaged in? Are other law schools developing similar classes? Anything that you can share with us about, about that would be extremely helpful as well. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor D'Souza. It's a pleasure for me to be here, an honor and a privilege uh, to be here. I was hired as a result of the uh, initiative that the BALSA initiative and then the faculty uh, resolution that uh, Dean Lally and uh, Professor Hassel talked about. I was hired to direct this course, which is kind of a daunting task, actually, but I think I'm up to it. We have five sections of the course, uh, the entire second year class is required to take the course. Uh, you cannot um, graduate from Roger Williams Law School unless you have had this course. 
and it's a graduation requirement. And we have uh, now uh, eight members of the faculty that are involved in presenting the course. And um, uh, we are uh, forging ahead. We've had one year's uh, kind of a maiden voyage. And now we're right now in the process of revising and tweaking and uh, figuring out what worked, what didn't work, uh, so that we can make a better presentation this coming fall. It's generally offered in the fall in each section. It's about 35 students in each section. Now, where Roger Williams fits in this in terms of legal education is important. Uh, there, uh, I've thought about this a little bit. There are basically three models that law schools have used. First of all, everyone should know that the American Bar Association, many institutions after the murder of George Floyd, both government institutions and private institutions, went through a period of introspection as to what they could do in terms of racism and the presence of racism and white supremacy in institutions that uh, they were involved with. The American Bar Association actually went through that and it adopted, it accredits law schools Roger Williams is an American Bar Association accredited law school, and there are accreditation standards. And so about a year ago, a little over a year ago now, the American Bar Association, Association amended its accreditation standards to require law schools to not offer a mandatory course, but to offer at least twice during the law student's uh, career, a three-year, generally a three-year, sometimes four-year career, in the law school, an opportunity to engage and learn about the, the problems of racism, discrimination, and uh, bias in the administration of the law, once at the beginning of the law school career, and then once more during the course of the law student's uh, uh, educational uh, sojourn. So now there have been three models based on that standard uh, accreditation standard that law schools have adopted. One is I would call the UCLA model, which is kind of where the law school creates a center or not a center, but a, uh, a group of faculty that would focus particularly on these issues and then seeks to attract scholars, seeks to attract students that are interested in, maybe offer an LLM or some specialty certificate in terms of race and the law and the like. And the law school sets itself up as a kind of a, a beacon for that kind of study. And that's pretty much uh, led by UCLA. They have a good number of uh, scholars of critical race theory who have been attracted to UCLA, but that's just one model. The second model is I would call the Virginia model where the University of Virginia established a center for the study of race and the law and although a student at the University of Virginia may not necessarily have to take a mandatory course, the presence of that center would create courses, again, attract faculty, and there would be like a, uh, a sort of uh, department or institution within the law school that would formally deal with the issue of uh, uh, white supremacy and racial hierarchy in the law and what could be done about it. Uh, and so then the third model is really what Roger Williams is doing. Only one other law school, as far as we can determine, there are a few around, but the other leading law school is also Penn State, at Dickin uh, formerly Dickinson Law School in Pennsylvania, where you have a mandatory course. Every student must take that course. There's an effort by the faculty to incorporate issues with respect to racial hierarchy and white supremacy in doctrine. As anyone who has uh, studied law would know, there are white supremacy issues that come up in property, in evidence, in criminal procedure, in constitutional law, in torts. And so uh, part of the Balsa demands was that they would, sometimes I've heard students say, I recognize my uncle in this criminal procedure case uh, because this is what happened to my uncle. And those kinds of things uh, should be discussed more in class so that people are aware of uh, how the law impacts on uh, uh, traditionally marginalized, underrepresented, and oppressed communities in our society. And so that's how Roger Williams sees itself as uh, approaching this problem 
one with a mandatory course for all students to take, and two, to have faculty be more cognizant and concerned about issues in the doctrinal courses uh, that come up. There is a, another model, actually, if I could talk a little bit more. Georgetown has an interesting approach. They asterisk courses, uh, various courses on particular um, uh, topics like mass incarceration or immigration or uh, civil rights. And then they will asterisk the course and say, in order to satisfy the ABA standard, you must take one of these courses and satisfy the, uh, the accreditation standard by having enrolled in one or more of the courses without having a center or any kind of a, a definite focus. And then there are variations on those things. So I'm very pleased to be here because Roger Williams is uh, leading the charge in terms of one of the uh, major approaches to this topic. And uh, uh, I think 20 years from now, many more law schools will be doing what Roger Williams is now doing. Thank you so much, Professor Freeman. And it's interesting that you talked about the mandatory nature of the course. And I think it's important for everyone to know that so much of law school is mandatory, right? I teach property, that's a 1L class. Students are, are not always, right? I hope they are, but they're not always delighted to take property, but they have to. And so this is very similar where we're taking the approach that, listen, we think you need this class in order to graduate from law school and be prepared to practice in our world and to uh, and to do an excellent job as a practicing attorney. So I, with that, I actually want to turn it over to uh, Nicole Dishlevsky, Professor Nicole Dishlevsky, who um, is going to talk to us a little bit about the impact that this course is having on our students um, and uh, what she's been able to observe. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, Professor Dushlevsky, first, just tell us a little bit about your role at the law school. It, it, you have enjoyed, in a way, a proximity to the students because of the variety of roles that you've had an opportunity to hold at the school. So that may be an, a useful way to, to begin some of your comments. So I'm really happy to be able to turn it over to you next. Thanks. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm really excited to see some of our alumni um, who are here. So uh, when we're talking about the history of our school and how we see ourselves, it's nice that there are people not just like Siobhan, who has taught the class, and Simone Tubman, who's also here, who has taught the class, but there are students who have seen the good, bad, and the ugly um, and have seen transformative change, have seen calls for transformative change. Um, and so uh, I just want to say, like, I'm excited that we get to still be in the community and reach out to you and talk to you about what's going on since you all have left. Um, before my current job, um, I was a reference librarian. So um, I had a lot of student contact, both by sitting at the reference desk and working with student groups. And then I kind of transitioned into teaching, uh, working with Diana um, developing the race class and then teaching in the race class. So Diana and I have taught the class twice as an elective. And then everyone on the screen, um, plus others have taught it once as a required class. Um, and every time it's a little bit different. Um, and I would say as far as what is uh, the impact on students, I think that it is like our students aren't a monolith. It's not um, as if they all have it, it had as if the class has the same impact or they all act in the same way. Um, I think uh, a lar largely what I can tell impacts to the class are based on students' personal experiences, their identities, um, their openness to learning about some of this material, um, sometimes their politics, um, sometimes wh where they're from what their educational experiences have been. Um, and uh, I think also um, how busy they are, right? Like some of this is really hard, uh, taking hours out of your week to, lead, to learn about, to read slave narratives is particularly difficult amidst the rest of this second year. Um, and so I think it, it varies a lot, um, but I would say generally I see sort of a similar arc to what Diana described, like the class itself has an arc, but I think the 
reactions of student or the impact on student has an arc. At first, I see a lot of disbelief, like, oh, you're telling me this stuff happened that I never knew happened. Why, why are you telling me this? Why haven't you taught me this before? Why hasn't anyone mentioned it? Or uh, I can't believe you're telling me this. And at the same time, this is what I already know. How do these two things go together? And just like a, an example is um, talking about Christopher Columbus. Um, so in our second class, we talk about colonialism. Part of that is talking about Christopher Columbus. And I think that there is some portion of our students who are like, wow, why do I know this sing-songy rhyme about a colonizer? And I don't know any of the nuance that goes with it. And so I think that they're like the first sort of history section is disbelief. Again, although there are some students who are, were history majors who grew up with this history, um, whose identity hasn't been able to shield them from it. And so it's not uniform, but I think it's disbelief. I think the second part of the class, people seem to sort of fall out of love with the law. Um, if the law has caused all of these problems and white supremacy is such a key part of the law or the constitution, um, how can I do this? How can I come to law school and then go be a lawyer knowing all of this? And I think the third part of the class brings some hope. Um, I, I see students really resolved to change the way things are um, and have been. And um, I think it, it there's also this sort of awareness over time. I think that as we start to teach these things, it sort of, sort of dawns on the students. This has been here the whole time and it's everywhere. And they start making connections and seeing things beyond what we're talking about in class. Um, and I think there is um, a, another type of student and, and I think that the impact that it has on the student is um, smaller in that I think that they can't take it in right now, whether that's they don't wanna take it in right now or it's too much with everything else going on. Um, and you know, I think it's probably unfair for me to call it the, the intractable student because I think in some ways this is so hard and so I'm not necessarily, I think intractable has such a negative connotation, but I think there are some students who right now, it is not impacting them. Um, but I think over time, we're gonna see that you can't unknow what you've learned. Um, and so that's sort of what I've seen. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was incredibly helpful. And I, you know, in particular, I'm struck by what you mentioned in terms of how our students are coming into this class and really they've had very different experiences in their lives prior to coming to the law school setting to this particular classroom and so they do have these very different reactions to the classroom material and that can segue nicely I think to to our next question which is for Professor uh, Diana Hassel because you've been teaching constitutional law for for a long period of time and Tom Law is not an easy class to teach um, and certainly is a class that also draws out a lot of uh, emotions and feelings, strong reactions um, from students. Um, and I'm wondering from that, through that lens, as a Khan Law professor, tell us a little bit about uh, what students can gain in doctrinal courses, right, and other courses, but in doctrinal courses such as constitutional law, through this lens that you're using also to teach the race and the uh, American foundations of the law course. Thanks, Monica. I had such an interesting experience this year because I taught um, race and the law in the fall and in the spring I taught constitutional law too, which is about individual rights. So, and uh, all of the students of course had taken the race and law because it's a required course for the first semester, second year. And students were making, you know, raising a, a case would come up and they would say, oh, this was during the Reconstruction era. Oh, all right. You know, like just making these connections historically and with other areas of law that just it just made me feel like, oh, my gosh, we're doing it. Um, so I think in some in some classes, those connections are more obvious. But I think in all classes, what we hope and I think is happening for students is some of the ways we've approached uh, cases or legal doctrine in the race and the law class they're bringing to the other class. So 
one of the things we do when we talk about a case in the race in the law class like Plessy or Dred Scott, very famous, well-known cases, we don't just talk about what's the rule of law, what does the dissent say? We say, who are these people? What are the real consequences on the ground? How did they get to this litigation? What happened after this litigation? What agency did they have as change makers? What were they, what political groups and community groups were they a part of? How did this come to be? And, and so I think students bring an issue of, well, don't just tell me the rule of law, tell me what really happens on the ground uh, and, and who is this affecting and who does this rule help and who does this rule harm? And let's try to put it in some kind of larger context than just black letter law. I think that's one of the important, the important things. Um, they bring this idea that the assumptions that are embedded in the law can become more visible if you look for them, right? If you look for them in terms of who wins these cases, who loses these cases, who are these people? Where do they come from? Where do they go to? Who are they connected to? And then again, reiterating throughout this very hard history of racial injustice that, that our country has, who's pushing for change? Who, cha who, what, when was transformation possible? Who was behind it? What were the agency, what kind of agency, what kind of community support, what kind of political motivation makes change in the law? Again, to set up students for, even though this is a difficult history and a difficult reality, it can be changed, it has been changed. How do we, how do, we do that? What parts of it uh, need to be done? And I think bringing that critical perspective to any area of law that students are taught is one of the, the most important um, the most important goals of this course. Thank you so much. That's incredibly helpful. And it also makes me think of what historically some of the law students' uh, concerns generally have been about legal education, where we tend to segment courses by doctrinal areas, and we never really have an opportunity to examine the entire context. And in a way, the more we learn about learning science and how students learn and how they can really uh, retain much of this information, even including the information that they're going to need to know for the bar examination, having this context makes that learning not only more enriching, certainly more empowering, as you mentioned, for them now as future uh, lawyers, but also it helps them to retain those very doctrinal rules that all of us are teaching um, in our classes. So with that, moving a little bit from the experience that they're getting in the classroom um, and thinking to some of the points that you made, Professor Hassel, in terms of how this is going to translate into their um, lives as practicing attorneys. And so if I would, I'm, I'm actually going to open this up to all of the panelists, um, how do you see this class in terms of the impacts that it can have on the practice of law um, in Rhode Island? And so we can think about this in a few different ways. Uh, we can think about it in terms of uh, what impact it might have on diversity within the bar, uh, the Rhode Island Bar Association uh, for us locally. Um, also thinking about this in terms of professional identity formation um, for our students, um, and also thinking about the impact that this will have ultimately on the clients that our students will serve as attorneys. So if um, it's okay, maybe I will turn to Lorraine first to talk a little bit about how you see this having an impact on diversity and particularly uh, even thinking about this locally here in the Rhode Island Bar. Thank you. Well, first, I just want to start with the demographic shift that we're hoping um, this will, that we're hoping it'll have an impact on the Rhode Island Bar. So I pulled statistics for um, demographics and right now black identified individuals in the US account for over 12% of the population, less than 7% of the attorneys. Looking at um, Hispanic Latinx, 
Um, it's 18% of the population, less than 6% of attorneys. And so Rhode Island has been, um, excuse me, Roger Williams has been engaged for a very long time in diversifying the legal profession and, of course, diversifying the legal profession here in Rhode Island. Um, our leaning into our diversity values is going to hopefully um, continue our demographic shift um, in terms of representation of law students. And hopefully we, we we work hard to keep them in Rhode Island and um, Judge Melissa DeBose is on our board of directors and works hard to keep lots of talented students in the state. And so there's going to be a changing demographic, but also through this course, our students have learned that the law is not always true to the values that they ascribe to it. And that the laws don't just reflect society, but the laws have been used to shape society for good and for bad. And during through this course, we we focus on ways that the law was specifically used to discriminate against persons of color, um, named explicitly in housing law and voting rights law. And it really questions, um, it forces students to really question what the law is, how it can be used to shape. And so we're training different types of lawyers who will hopefully be using the law as a tool to move closer to their individual and personal values. Thank you so much. And those statistics are incredibly uh, enlightening to think about this in terms of just the representation or lack thereof that we currently have um, in the bar. Um, Nicole, if you don't mind, Professor Dushlevsky, I'll turn to you next to talk to us a little bit about how you see this course and maybe others like it as other law schools hopefully begin to also teach a course such as this. What, are, what is the impact that it might have on professional identity formation for attorneys? Yeah, that's a great question. I think as our students are always trying to figure out what does being a lawyer mean? And I think for, for many years, we have sent the message that uh, lawyers look like older white men. Um, and so one way that I hope that this class and uh, you know our curriculum changing for the better, I think one impact is that hopefully we can change that narrative. Um, and I don't think this class alone will do it, but I think we're doing a whole lot of work here at Roger Williams. And I'm so glad we're partnering with the Women's Bar Association um, to say that that's not the only way that a lawyer can look. It, the stereotype doesn't need to be real. Um, I think that the course itself um, are uh, helping students be made aware of how lawyers have failed in the past um, whether it's on housing issues, civil rights issues, mass incarceration, um, uh, slavery, um, also how lawyers have succeeded, um, how lawyers have successfully advocated for change, and how lawyers have stayed silent and um, allowed the status quo of harm to continue. I think the class um, provides a way uh, of not just reading and memorizing doctrinal law, but of reflecting on this, not just what is the law, but who does it affect. And I think the class does a good job of reinforcing, we don't just need to know what the law is, we need to know it, who it's impacting. Who is it designed to impact? Who is it explicitly designed to impact? Who is it actually impacting? And does that matter? Um, and then I think like sort of going forward, how this impacts Rhode Island is that I think that students who graduate from our school or other schools that have similar programming are going to have different expectations of what being a lawyer is and what justice is. And I think that that is gonna change the practice of law. I think that is gonna change the judiciary I think that is going to change what law looks like. And I'll just give an example. Um, in our class, in one of the later weeks, we read a story about a judge in Virginia who uh, accepted a motion by defense counsel to take down the portraits um, in the courtroom. And I believe it was a portraits of all white men, um, it, thinking that that was going to impact justice. And after that, the students um, walk around the law school and they need to do sort of an assessment of what message are we sending by the portraits on our walls? 
And I, we get responses from students who are in their second year, so might be in internships or have worked in the summer as clerks or as externs. And they say, wow, I now started to notice what the portraits on the walls meant and what impact, what are we signaling to people? And I think when we start graduating students who are no longer willing to accept those signals as what law is, I think law itself is gonna start changing or I guess I'm hopeful that law itself is in Rhode Island and beyond is gonna start changing. Thank you so much. And I like that hopeful note. I really do. I think we need it in these times, right, that we're living through. And you mentioned something interesting as well in terms of just some of the substantive areas that we're looking at, housing, education. And it, it brings me again to this practical impact because students always want to know, how is this going to help me as a practicing lawyer? And so with that, I wanted to turn it to Professor Freeman because you, you've been involved in doing some of this work in your own life as a practicing lawyer. You've handled school funding cases and um, you've been in the trenches. So tell us a little bit, if you would, about how you see this class, uh, the way, not just the material, but the way that it's being uh, taught to the students. Um, what is the impact that you foresee this having on our students' future clients? Yes, uh, Professor, that's a very good question. Um, uh, I focus, one of the uh, exercises we do in the class is an exercise, it's actually an old one, but it's very useful, involving a, a story um, told by a woman who's now a Harvard Law Professor, uh, Lucy White, and she describes a just a representation of a African-American woman with, I think, five children, who has a welfare fraud hearing. And so even though Lucy White is very progressive, very forward thinking, uh, liberal legal services lawyer, the story that she tells makes it plain that all the things that really affected the African-American client, she just went, it just went over her head for various kinds of, of reasons. One is because of stereotypes. She had stereotyped the client. She had also stereotyped the decision maker, the administrator who was gonna decide whether the client was guilty of welfare fraud. And it was a small amount of, uh, of a personal injury settlement that the client used to buy Sunday shoes for her daughters rather than go out and you know spend money in a gambling casino she brought her daughters needed new shoes and she bought the shoes with that money. And, uh, and so by taking that example, the example was able, I, I, I thought it was very good in that the students then when they go into these circumstances, whether it be as the legal services lawyer or as a public defender or even as a prosecutor or a lawyer in a civil case, they develop skills that are helpful in terms of combating the traditional sort of things that work to further white supremacy, racial hierarchy, gender discrimination, discrimination against people who have children, all those kinds of things that are built into the legal system that lawyers just take for granted. So I think after doing that exercise, in class, uh, at least I'm, hope, I'm hopeful like Nicole, that many of the lawyers will no longer take uh, the law students when they get out of school and pass the bar and start practicing, that they will no longer take those kinds of things for granted so that they will listen, that they will see the relevance of something that the client does that before you would just dismiss as not being relevant, it turns out that it is a relevant thing that the client did and why the client did it, even though it may look silly at first uh, blush, uh, it turns out to be important uh, to the client. And if it's important to the client, it's probably going to be important in the case. And so it's uh, really just making them, that's one message we try to get across, it's going to make them better lawyers to be aware of these issues. because. There are good lawyers, but the better lawyer is the one who is really aware 
of those kinds of issues in representing someone who's traditionally been discriminated against or oppressed or not given a voice in the legal system. Uh, public defenders are, it's another area, you know, in terms of what's happening in prison, why people go to prison, why judges give uh, African American defendant, male defendants usually two or three times the sentence that white defendants get, why that happens, how you could argue to prevent that from happening, uh, listening to the client in terms of the kinds of things that the client wants the court to know at sentencing. All those kinds of things are important, and the course is able to uh, convey that so that a student is armed with, uh, with uh, uh, weapons that will help break down this, uh, this kind of, of uh, how would you describe it, a uh, edifice of uh, white supremacy and racial hierarchy that still exists in our legal system. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to uh, extend another invitation uh, to everyone who's here today. If you wanted to pose a question to our panelists um, to do so, please, in the chat. Um, and also, if there are no questions from those who are here today um, as, as participants, perhaps uh, one of the panelists has any further thoughts that they may want to share with us uh, before we close. So I'll open it up to- Looks uh, like I have, I have oh, sorry, Bernard. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking about the impact this course is gonna have uh, on uh, lawyers, on future lawyers and, and soon to be uh, lawyers. And I just think what a delight it is to have this conversation and to have the tools of this conversation be the common language of lawyers. So when you bring up the issue of, I think there's implicit bias in here, or wasn't this law structured in a way to disadvantage people in this situation? You're not, you're not alone. There, we've all, many of us will have learned that now. Many of us will have the tools to discuss that. You wouldn't be looked at as, what does that have to do with anything? And I think that that freedom and that conversation in that becomes the common parlance of lawyers will just have a tremendous impact on what's possible, on what's acceptable, on how things should be done differently, how change can make, if this is always part of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about the impact of law. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. I love that concept of a lingua franca, right? We're developing this new lingua franca for all of us. Uh, Professor Freeman, yes, go right ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say there looks like some questions in the chat. Ah, thank you. Yes, so we do. We have one from Natasha Variani. Hello, Natasha. Uh, so Natasha says, hello, thank you for doing this very important work. I've been reading and thinking about rest as resistance, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little about the cost of this work on those who are really engaged in it. Have you found some best practices for dealing with it? Community? Question mark. So question for the panelists there. Anyone who would like to respond? Uh, Nicole, go right ahead. We're all laughing because the answer is like, no, we haven't found any solutions. We found <laughs> a lot of not best practices. Um, but I think the suggestion of community is the closest that we've come. Um, we have, we don't all agree. In fact, most of us, even among the five of us don't agree about much. But we agree about the importance of the work and we have a tremendous kinship from that. Um, but we are also exhausted. Um, but there is also this feeling that like we have the opportunity to change legal education at this school and beyond. We have the opportunity to what Diana just said, change like the way th the concepts that are uh, sort of understood by everyone. And we how many times are we going to have that opportunity? So let's take advantage of it now and we just run. Um, because this is so important and needs to be changed. So I think um, Natasha makes a point that we're not, we're struggling with that amongst ourselves, but we're lucky that we have each other. Absolutely. Nicely said. Dean Lally, go right ahead. 
Yeah, and if I could just add that, you know, as a Black woman, it was really hard to learn, not learn the material, but read it and teach it to our students. And so I just tried to acknowledge how emotionally impactful it was for me as an individual. And I hope for the students in the class, especially those who identify as students of color, um, to read week after week how your country failed to deliver on its promise to you or was very strategic in its discrimination especially post-reconstruction. And so acknowledging those harms and the impacts was important um, personally, but it took a lot of resolve to um, be able to absorb all of the material and then to um, work with students in a way that was going to, that the material is going to be helpful for their personal identity formation and their legal practice. Thank you for that. Very much. There's a, another interesting question in the chat from Colleen, Colleen Murphy. And uh, Colleen asks, have we considered doing a CLE with some of the substantive content from the course? Yes, I think that would be important um, to do. Um, in evidence, I uh, we talk about the, the flight as a relevant fact in terms of um, uh, the consciousness of guilt. Uh, I even had an exam question on this. However, if you go to Washington Heights and the police pull up uh, out, outside of McDonald's, everybody runs away from the police. And it's, so it's a different, uh, uh, it's a way of looking at relevance. Whether and It turns out that everybody running is not really relevant. And so issues like relevance, issues like uh, in criminal procedure, some of the uh, uh, suppression issues in criminal procedure, um, uh, confessions, all kinds of things like that would make good uh, topic for uh, uh, individual CLE on a particular, in each er person's area of expertise in constitutional law or evidence or property. Uh, and uh, we should do that. I think we should do that. That's a good suggestion. It's an excellent suggestion. And Colleen, I'm signing you up as the first participant, okay? <laughs> so that we have time for one more question. It's going to be from Christopher Patrick. And he asks, are there any other jurisdictions or countries you can identify as a model having laws that are fairer to all races um, as opposed to the US and Rhode Island? Does anyone want to... Answer this one. I think this is a difficult one, Christopher. You may have. Uh... The only thing I could think about is uh, South Africa. The South Africa's history of apartheid resulted in a very progressive constitution being adopted, and then also progressive uh, principles of uh, criminal procedure law and the like. Uh, at, but I am not sure if those progressive policies that were adopted by the African National Congress after the overthrow of the apartheid government, whether they have come down on the ground, I just don't know. Although I also know that affirmative action, for example, in South Africa now is an important fact. The universities, which were privileged and all white, are now open to Africans. Uh, South Africa is 90%. Uh, African and only 10% or less uh, people of European descent. And so what that impact has been in terms of university administration would be a good question. But that's the only place I can think where uh, you might say that there's at least some effort to uh, be fair in terms of uh, racial discrimination and white supremacy. Because South Africa prior to the uh, election of Nelson Mandela the release of Nelson Mandela and his election as president, South Africa was the pinnacle of white supremacy. And so the, South, the effort of the South African government to overcome the legacy of white supremacy would be important uh, for a place like Rhode Island to look at. Thank you so much for that. And Dean Lally, go right ahead. I just want to, I guess I would answer the question a little bit differently. And instead of focusing on a model country that's doing this better, I think it's so important that this course really investigates the role of the U.S. in having chattel slavery. Um, 
codified in law um, and racial supremacy codified in law. And so before we look to the model, I think it's really important that we have a rush, racial reckoning in terms of what the legacy and impacts of those um, of those laws are, um, especially as we look at Jim Crow and pre-civil rights, that it's still just one generation away. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a very important point. And I think it's a, a point we can, oh, and I see Professor Dyshlevsky's hand as well. Go right ahead. Sure, uh, I would say, uh, look, look, looking to Connecticut, I'm specifically talking about the issue of equity. So Connecticut last year passed a law that says the governor's bill has to have an equity statement. They can't propose a budget without showing how it adjusts, uh, how it addresses racial and so socioeconomic equalities. And it is to people who have historically been uh, discriminated against. Um, and so uh, that is an example of uh, something equitable that is being done in a different state and um, that there is currently a bill being proposed in Rhode Island. Um, there is a, a big uh, advocacy day on Thursday about that bill um, that would have the same thing. It would have the governor's budget bill require equity statements. There's another bill that would require all legislation in Rhode Island to have equity statements. So I think that, you know, there are models for this and then there are ways where these discussions are happening right now. And um, as Morgan put in the chat, um, this isn't a law, but if you are looking for ways to support some of this work, our, uh, the Rhode Island courts are seeking public comment on the amendments to rule four, uh, Article 4, Rule 3, uh, the MCLE rules to specifically require uh, a diversity, uh, mandatory diversity credit every year. Um, and so that is another way that we are changing. And the hope is that our state continues to change and our profession continues to change. I would add to that also the adoption by the ABA of a model rule 8.4G, which makes uh, it uh, professional misconduct to engage in harassment or discrimination in the practice of law. Uh, most rules before that had said you had to have a finding by an agency, employment discrimination agency, or some other agency before a lawyer could be charged with uh, uh, harassing or discriminating someone on the basis of race, sex, national origin, ethnicity, sexual orientation is a long list. But now the rule has been, the model rule has been changed to make that uh, professional misconduct. And so that also may have an impact on how people practice uh, those states that are uh, adopting the new model rule. Thank you so much. I am wanna be respectful of everybody's time. So I think we should close, but I wanted to say just before we leave that I hope one of the things we were able to convey is just how we're excited we are as a community to be doing this work. And we really want to bring in as many people as possible from the community into the work that we are doing. So we hope that this is just the beginning of a dialogue that we're having with all of you out there and that you'll reach out to us if you're interested in this and we'll find ways such as a substantive CLE or other opportunities to really bring you in to the work that the law school is doing on this work. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you all again for being here today on this beautiful day, uh, but spending time with us, choosing to spend time with us. And um, we're glad we were able to get you this credit as well, CLE credit, very important. Okay, so everybody, so listen, thank you to all our fabulous panelists. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for coming.